Thank you for joining the GLTF webinar, How Do We Solve the Challenges of GLTF Asset Creation? Joining us for today's webinar are Eric Chadwick from Wayfair, Pavel Nickel from CG Trader, Max Limper from DGG, and Mike Festa from Super DNA 3D Lab. First, a couple of housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the presentation, please ask them using the Q&A feature located on your Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We are recording this webinar and we'll share the link along with the slides and the recording shortly after. At the end of the session, please complete the short survey form to help us better design future events. With that, let's get the webinar started with Eric Chadwick from Wayfair. Eric? Awesome, thanks Jeff. Uh, so here's today's agenda. Uh, we have a great set of people presenting today. Uh, these are experts involved daily in creating 3D assets and all the great challenges that come with it. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Eric. I work on rendering in real-time 3D pipelines at Wayfair. And I'm also the co-chair of the asset creation group within 3D Commerce. Uh, my background is about 20 years of experience in 3D for games and visualization and education. So I'll start with uh, kind of an overview of what 3D Commerce is and what we do and what we're working on specifically in the asset creation group. Uh, then, uh, then we'll have Pavel go through the components of a good asset pipeline and how to scale the whole process. Then Max will cover how to make assets work in different places and what that means for content creators. Uh, and then Mike will show his work on an asset validation system that we've been designing together in the working group. Uh, after that, we'll open the floor to the room. You know, what topics are important to you? Uh, remember that the Q&A button is always there in Zoom, and you should, we encourage you to ask questions at any time. So what is 3D Commerce? Well, it's a bunch of tech companies that met together at SIGGRAPH back in 2019 to uh, figure out, you know, how do we address the common challenges in using 3D for e-commerce? Uh, we're a collection of technology and commerce companies, and we're in weekly calls to figure out these solutions together. We basically all need to make 3D models that accurately represent our products, showcasing them in a, an appealing way, and we need to transmit these models really efficiently. Uh, we've been making a lot of progress on solving these issues, in large part because there's a clear and present commercial opportunity for many of us. So we've all come together, to kind of figure these things out. So there's a really busy slide. There's a lot here, but I'm not going to talk to it all. But we split up the tasks into these technical subgroups to manage the work. Uh, in asset creation, we've been developing uh, content creation guidelines to help artists and designers figure out how to create 3D assets that can be reliably and easily deployed to millions of end users. And we've been working on an open asset, uh, an open source asset checking tool to kind of assess the reliability of these 3D assets. Uh, and Mike will cover more on that later. Uh, and we're working on tutorials and guidelines since these things are not always uh, easy to figure out and they're always changing. And we want creatives to be able to do their work better and more easily. We all experience the pains of, of dealing with these uh, kind of new content guidelines uh, and, and making new assets. Uh, so how can we make a difference and kind of improve the ecosystem? Uh, but that's it basically in a nutshell. Now I'm gonna hand it off to Pavel to talk about the process of building a content creation pipeline. Hey, uh, thanks Eric. So my name is Pavel. I am director of technology at CG Trader. I'm a contributor to a few working group, Kronos uh, working groups and TSGs. I have over 10 years experience in 3D art, VR, AR development, pipeline automation, and data visualization. And my presentation will be, uh, like mentioned, uh, mainly about the asset journey and uh, the, the, the scaling pipeline on the uh, high business level. And then the guys will take you more in depth technically. So uh, let's proceed, please. So first, I'll briefly mention the asset journeys. For some of you, it might be obvious. For some, not necessarily. So there are two main stages we can uh, distinguish in terms of asset creation, the altering or asset, asset life cycle, the altering and delivery. And the altering is the phase where uh, engineers and designers uh, work on the uh, on the product and then on the 3D asset in, in various formats, uh, whether it's CAD or mesh-based. 
Um, and then when we transition to delivery, this is the phase where and we actually show the asset to you, to end consumers, to uh, to people that want to, I know, purchase your 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 item, for example, right? So those two steps, those two stages, have uh, totally different uh, tools and totally different requirements. So if you look at the outering uh, stage, we have tools, so DCC, so digital content creation uh, applications, and we have three D formats, right? Outering formats that allow you to exchange the information amongst those uh, different applications to to work on the asset. And then we have features that we require, uh, which is flexibility. So again, you want to be able to work with different tools on the same asset, depending on the stage of the asset. Maybe you're working with something cut based. Maybe you're working on something more artistic, but it's still uh, you still need to be able to interchange uh, these assets amongst the artists, amongst the designers and the engineers, right? And you work in somewhat controlled ecosystem. So you know the tools you're working with, you know how your asset is going to be viewed and how your asset is going to be used, right? So this is the scenario, or this is the case when you're working on outering. But when you move to delivery, so when you move to this uh, end goal for e-commerce, for example, right? So when you move to this, uh, ecosystem when you actually have to present the asset to the customers, your tools no longer are tools, they become publishing targets. So instead of DCCs you work with and the formats, you actually have platforms you show those uh, assets on and have devices that display those assets to the end consumers. And there's no way for you to control uh, who is using your asset and how. So uh, it comes with a bit different challenges and requirements. And then the features you require from your outering tools like flexibility, and you have this controlled ecosystem, they become actually expectations towards the asset, right? So you no longer need your asset to be flexible. You don't have to pass it amongst different applications to, to alter it, to work on it. However, you expect it to be shown in the best possible way, right? With best possible results and with maximum consistency because uh, if you're presenting, uh, let's say, furniture piece, you need to make sure that it doesn't matter if the person is viewing it in the web browser or on their mobile, whether it's iOS or Android, or they do it in AR or just in the viewer. You want it to look always exactly the same, exactly as you intend to, as they were actually looking at in, in the store, right? So these are the, the, the two different um, stages. So can we please uh, move forward? Now, if we zoom in a little bit and see how the transition looks like, uh, the control ecosystem, which is the DCCs and the formats, uh, in this case, I listed some uh, uh, different ones, one like Blender and 3 Max that allow you mainly to work on meshes, SolidWorks, which is the, the, the tool for working with CAD, so engineering data, and there's a lot of uh, more tools like this, and flexibility, right? So the formats like USD, like FBX, like JT, uh, that allow you to store the content in somewhat lossless uh, form, and then transition and transmit it uh, amongst the, the different DCCs. But how do we transition to, 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 to leave behind all the outering flexibility and how do we meet all the expectations? So we, I shown here uh, best possible results, results and consistency. In terms of best possible results, uh, it's always uh, it's not one thing. There's no no silver bullet, right? It depends. So in case, for example, if the input is available for for the user, then both possible result is that you can allow your customer to actually play with the asset, right? However, if the bandwidth is a factor, then minimization of the asset is a key. Like this is the best possible result. Like the asset is super small and it, wa and it loads uh, extremely quickly, even on a slower internet connection. Then if performance is a factor, then optimization is, is extremely important, right? And then if there's no limitations regarding hardware or network, then the highest possible visual quality is the best possible result, right? So I just want to highlight that a best possible result is not one thing. It depends on um, on the device or the platform or limitations you might or your customers might have uh, when they view your asset. And then the consistency, which uh, is the second important thing that I mentioned, um, I'll just briefly mention a few few things that we we try to do to match that consistent, like to to meet that consistency, right? So we work on asset creation guidelines. You can have asset validation tools. Uh, there, there can be viewer certification program, and you want predictable format most of all. You want to be able to uh, be sure that it always view, is viewed exactly the same way. So if we please move forward, 
uh, our answer uh, is this distillation format GLTF that you're probably familiar with. Um, so uh, this is again a bit zoomed out, uh, and uh, the reason we call it distillation is because you 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 kind of lose those authoring uh, capabilities, but you gain the consistency uh, that you that you expect. And there's a lot of effort uh, in Kronos Group put into. Uh, like I mentioned, asset creation guidelines, uh, the validation tool that uh, Mike will uh, go through later uh, during the webinar. There's a viewer certification program when we try to make sure that every viewer that is certified views the, the asset exactly the same way. So there's no um, there's no uh, friction or, or there's no uh, inconsistencies. And this is this predictable format that can be always, always viewed the same way, like it's being called JPEG of 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 uh, of 3D, right? So we we want to make sure that uh, whatever device, whatever the limitations, you can always uh, view it and you can always uh, see it. And then uh, if we look down uh, from GLTF, we 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 suggest uh, to have high level of automation to actually be able to um, make this asset work on various uh, platforms on various devices, and this is something that. Max will uh, take you through a bit more in depth later. Um, so if we can please move forward. Now I'll talk a little bit about um, delivering process and scale, and this will be only high level business overview. Uh, but if we're talking about e-commerce, if we're talking about retail, if we're talking about big product companies um, that you might be a part of or might you work with, uh, I, I do believe that scale is is extremely important uh, to mention, even on the at least all on the on the high level in terms of approach and mindset. So, regardless if you're working uh, as a small studio or you you're working uh, as a huge company, the, the basic flow is somewhat the same, right? Like you have the order, you have the demand for the asset creation, uh, you you have people create the asset, then there's the QA step maybe then there's a customer QA step if you're working as an external vendor and then there's a delivery so this is straightforward uh, however if we move forward to the next slide there are some uh, changes in terms of approach that are worth to be done to make this process um, efficient like cost efficient time efficient so uh, if you think about how small agencies work and and how the assets are delivered in let's say uh, simpler scenarios, you just have like one project, one uh, one batch of units. Maybe it's fifty assets, maybe it's two hundred assets, but it's still manageable. You give it to the people who have very specific requirements, and then and then you deliver it. You finish the project, right? And then if the new order comes, you start over. However, if you want to streamline the production, if you want to really be able to scale in terms of thousands or tens of thousands of assets, uh, then you want to think about your uh, process more as an assembly line. You don't want to take like very custom approach. You want to really streamline the production and, and don't think about, hey, this is those five assets. These are five different assets for different projects. You just want to have people create assets and that's it, right? And this brings me to, to the second point. You would like to, in my opinion, at least, you should move from project management approach to process management approach. If you do project management, uh, then you're very limited in terms of uh, your um, throughput, like because uh, the, the people factor uh, is important, and there's a lot of communication, and there's a lot of custom things. If you have one process that can be done, it's modular, and then can be modified, uh, then your 3D artists, like in our case, we we work with over 9,000 uh, 3D artists, right? So we want to maintain one process, and the artists they shouldn't think about the project they're working on. They should just know that they're working on asset. And when they're done, they're working on the next asset. And they shouldn't care that there's different requirements, that there are uh, different, different technical uh, challenges. And they don't. They, they shouldn't have to learn what they need to do. They just need to be able to, to do and be able to be plugged in and plugged out of the process, depending on the demand. Because again, the demand over the year fluctuates, right? The marketing budgets change, the, the seasons change. So it's not like you always have exactly the same number of assets constantly streamlining. Like sometimes you need more, sometimes you need less. So you need to be able to plug in the people to the process and plug them out and put them to the to, to the different project without them noticing, without the friction for them. Um, 
And this brings me to my last point. Uh, of course, you want to automate as much as possible. If we have uh, different uh, requirements, like we have uh, the perfect case scenario is, we can maybe move forward to the next slide. Uh, in the perfect case scenario, we would have uh, just one workflow for everything, one workflow for QA, and then automation does all the rest. It's of course not always possible. However, we do what we can uh, to to make that happen uh, in our organizations, but also together in Kronos Group and uh, the format, the GLTF format, we believe is a good entry point uh, as this uh, source deliverable that then can be optimized for different um, for different different use cases. And we can maybe move forward. So this is very uh, this is an abstract example of automation from authoring to delivery. So on the left side we have the input data. So either it's mesh or cut or scans, but this is these are this is the phase when when it's still uh, when they're still in somewhat authoring uh, step. We want to distill it from this authoring ecosystem to GLTF. Then we do some validation. We end up with source, source deliverable. That can be then automate uh, automatically converted to deliverables for different platforms, different use cases. Um, and then now I will uh, hand it over to Max that will take you through uh, tools and, and approach to to actually automating this uh, this process. And then Mike will uh, cover the validation step uh, that I mentioned and what we do in Kronos to to make it uh, easier for everyone. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Pavel. And hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. joining. Really a pleasure really to be here with you. And very quick introduction about myself. Um, I'm active in Kronos in the 3D Commerce Asset Creation TSG, where I'm also co-chair right now. I'm also co-founder and CEO at DGG. We're creating a software called Rapid Compact. And uh, yeah, actually, we didn't update this here at Sigrof. We had a booth, but the page is still online, and we actually have even a virtual model of the booth as a GLTF file that you can put in your space if you missed it. So maybe it's good that it's still there. Um, yes, and in this part, I want to talk a bit more about the technical details of how to make 3D assets fit different requirements, and that means uh, software requirements, uh, but also hardware and application requirements. And just go a little bit more into detail um, of what, what Pavel already gave some hints about. And next slide, uh, please. Thanks. Um, here you can see how we um, like uh, picture the process ourselves in the 3D Commerce Asset Creation Guidelines. There's a similar picture. We'll uh, in this presentation use the stained glass lamp as an example, which is also a reference model that uh, Eric from Wayfair provided. So thanks for that. And um, if you think about it, like uh, past 10 years, 3D models were mainly created for offline CGI, right? So to generate beautiful photorealistic catalog images. And this is the process that you see there on top. So um, the model is stored in some exchange authoring format, be it 3DS Max, um, and then using V-Ray render, or, <coughs> sorry, or Maya and Arnold. And um, whatever it is. Uh, so some DCC renderer combination and it's a large file and you create um, a photorealistic picture. So now uh, with all the real-time 3D and all these applications coming up that are really exciting and helpful, uh, we have a challenge, however, which is that all these applications have different requirements. So we have our beautiful assets, uh, possibly even like from uh, the um, CGI projects, right? because people already create these uh, pictures for their catalog, and now we want to bring them into the real-time apps. So that um, requires us to first translate the model uh, like of the materials to a model that is usable in real-time. And um, that means the PBR model, and GLTF supports such a PBR material model, USDZ also. And um, these are already two formats where you can see that maybe you want to create a different version for iOS, right? And then you have for uh, Android to support the Atlas AR on both. And there might be other um, applications where you want a version of that 3D model as well. And depending on application requirements, you want the data to look slightly different. And that's something we have also investigated. Uh, next slide, please. So depending on the application, uh, you might, for example, have different requirements regarding the polygon count, uh, like um, 
how fluent does it uh, like uh, render? Like if you have 100K polygons, it depends on the application and on the client's device, right? Is it part of a big scene in the floor planner where you have like 20 assets that are shown at the same time? Or is it just shown as a standalone view? And then there are also these bandwidth requirements, for example, like, um, let's say I want to see this model on the user screen after less than half a second or less than three seconds. Uh, and maybe it's a preview version that you're showing. So that preview version should probably show up almost instantly, right? And when do you want to have the, the real version loaded? So that can all be answered if you have some estimation about the average bandwidth that you're serving or like the minimum bandwidth. And um, depending on that, you can derive requirements on the asset again. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, next, yeah, thanks. Um, so here we can see an example of compression that helps us to reduce the file size of the model during streaming. And uh, one thing that you can do if you have like uh, textures, texture files, for example, for the model, then you can encode them uh, with JPEG and that helps already to reduce the file size, right, during the transmission. And some parts might need to be encoded with PNG if they have, for example, an alpha channel. Um, then, um, yeah, like a PNG, however, has the problem that uh, it usually like is quite large, right? So if you wanna keep the transmission size low, you have to think about uh, alternatives as well. And uh, one way to achieve a reasonably low transmission size, but also in addition, as you can see on the upper right-hand side, a great reduction in a GPU size, so like the memory that the asset takes when it is on the client device and in video memory. Uh, that, that one way to do this is uh, using the Chronox uh, texture um, container KTX. And uh, that container supports compressed texture formats such as ETC1S or UASTC. And if you use them the right way, like UASTC, for example, is recommended for the normal maps and ETC1S for the base color maps here then you can achieve a lower file size and a lower memory footprint without a notable loss in quality, as you can see. So this was a quite interesting experiment. And uh, yeah, the model is also available. More info can be found also uh, in the link that Eric posted in the chat. So this is one option to compress the textures. And there's another option uh, to use Draco compression with GLTF if you would like to compress the geometry. And um, that also helps a lot if the model is very like geometry heavy, if it has a lot of vertices, uh, right? And uh, a lot of triangles. Um, next slide, please. So both of these options, compressing the geometry and compressing textures uh, might not be supported by all the viewers. So then the question arises, what do I do? Do I just impose that on all the viewers that I ask them to all support like, um, the maximum possible feature set and um, the answer that um, like GLTF here takes is no. Um, I want the asset to be able to be rendered in as many viewers as possible and everything that comes uh, on top, uh, if I can, can achieve that, um, then I want to have a fallback plus an optional extension and the viewers that support this extension display it and the others display the fallback. And a good example for us is material variance that you can see on the upper right. So this can be used, for example, to provide like three different versions of a shoe or of a um, yeah, like t-shirt or whatever it is, like if something comes in color variations, but you can also do cool things with it, like here, having the lamp on or off. So there's one material variant where the lamp is on, one where it is off, and then if this extension is not supported, we'll just use the first material and then your lamp is maybe always on or always off, with, which I think is a good result uh, because it's better to still show the asset then than not being able to show it. So these extensions are quite powerful. And um, again, like fallbacks are in place. And another aspect uh, was already mentioned earlier, like when, when I said uh, USDZ being one target format for the iOS devices, as you know, it's different from GLTF. Uh, the material model is a bit different. And um, we're talking about specifically USDZ 
as it is de facto um, like uh, made a standard by the iOS implementation. And uh, that, for example, has no support for something like the transmission effect that you see on the bottom right. So the transmission effect means I have something like alpha blending, uh, but on top I have uh, the possibility to display reflections like in this glass and um, they do not kind of fade out. Huh? So um, that looks way more realistic and more believable. Unfortunately, with USDC, we cannot do that um, with the standard implementation and we have to fall back to alpha blending. So that is something um, that, yeah, Pavel mentioned the term distillation. Like if we take GLTF and we have our assets, let's say in, in GLTF as our yeah, real-time master format and we, convert down to USDC, we might uh, need to account for some of these fallbacks to encode it in such a way that yeah, USDC still supports it and it, that it at least looks okay. And uh, yeah, next slide, please. So if we summarize that, right, and we look at the different um, challenges, uh, as you can see, it's not trivial to support all these publishing targets, but it's something that we have to do if we want to be able to serve all the applications and all the many users out there. And so, first of all, we looked at hardware and like bandwidth constraints, like, okay, what's the maximum number of triangles that I want to support, uh, be able to support, or a number of megabytes, so a bandwidth, and then uh, derive that basically from the application and my um, audience, my assumptions there. And we made some hints uh, on like what could be a good starting value there in the asset creation guidelines and the publishing target section. And then there are various uh, requirements on software or formats. And um, I mentioned GLTF extensions as one mechanism to cope with those and uh, the translation to USDC as one thing that needs to be like uh, taken care of in that regard. And as Pavel mentioned, if we can automate these processes, uh, that's always the way to go, right? So um, automation pipelines are really needed because maybe now you serve like three different real-time platforms, but maybe in the future you want to serve 10 or more and also different kinds of end-user devices. So the more automated that process is, the better. And um, we have defined publishing targets, um, check them out and as a creation guidelines, fallbacks uh, was also mentioned. And uh, one topic that uh, I only touched slightly here is the 3D viewer conformance. So like I mentioned, there are different viewers and some of them support some extensions and others support others. So what you will have to do is of course, then check like what viewer do I want to use? and make sure that your assets work for that viewer. So um, that means you also have to check your assets basically for like different aspects like, okay, um, are let's say my viewer supports um, only certain extensions and others not, then I wanna catch that when people submit assets and they model something with an extension that my viewer doesn't support, I wanna catch that, right? And I wanna catch that also in an automated process. And um, that is uh, the topic of asset QA. And Mike is going to talk a bit about that um, in the next part. So yeah, um, thanks for your attention so far. Looking forward to the Q&A and handing it over for now to Mike. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, great to be here today. Um, I'm Mike Festa. I've been in this kind of a 3D technology space for a little while now. Um, I was at Wayfair when we were starting this um, Kronos 3D Commerce Group. Um, I ran a company called 3XR for a number of years. We were a startup working on um, streamlining content creation. Um, and right now I'm a freelance, uh, basically software developer slash um, you know, consultant. I'm working as the chief strategy officer with SuperDNA. Um, SuperDNA provides content creation at scale. Uh, I'm going to talk through a little bit about the challenges in the process as we think about content creation. Um, we're going to talk through the motivation for why, you know, we need an asset validator. That's, you know, pretty quick because as we've been talking throughout today's presentation, um, there's a real need to get content that can be automatically checked in order to do this at a large scale. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about this, um, you know, project I've been working on, on behalf of Kronos. It's an open source project and, uh, you know, you're free to check it out today. It's actually almost complete. So we're excited about wrapping up version one and then looking forward to getting community feedback and suggestions for the continued development uh, for version two starting next year. Um, so you can go ahead to the next slide. 
Cool. Yeah. So as we think about, you know, the content creation process, um, you know, especially when you're getting into this, you know, volume and scale and kind of the model factory type of approach, um, you know, you're working with a lot of different source files and you're trying to standardize those inputs. But where we end up finding that there's a decent amount of, of time uh, spent is on that, you know, quality assurance and in, you know, checking one that it visually represents the product, which is still probably going to be a manual step, but the other aspects like the technical, you know, requirements, does it need the right file size? Is it, you know, using the right size textures? Is it using too many, you know, meshes or not enough? A lot of those questions can be answered through an automated process. And our goal is to try to, you know, create the content at the higher standard and then have automation that can then distill the asset down to the various use cases at you know different specifications. Uh, so we believe that we can save a lot of you know manual time in the QA process where you're not necessarily having to check every single you know deliverable if that one file matches your product and you feel good about the kind of you know source asset, then you should be able to feel confident that that asset is then going to be usable in a number of different places. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Again, speaking to the you know motivation around this, um, you know, a typical supplier or manufacturer you know that makes these products and sells them today omni-channel online, they're not just selling on one place, right? They have uh, you know Amazon and Target and Wayfair and Lowe's and all the retail channels you know that we listed, and they're trying to you know manage that content, and now they're being asked from more and more people about 3D. And you know, maybe initially they were using 3D for for one use case. Maybe it was that you know photorealistic offline. I'm going to make imagery, and now I have imagery. Images are kind of easy. We can push images out through our standard you know management platform, right? So there's a lot of existing tools today for your product information that you can push out um, in a distributed way, but there aren't really a lot of tools for doing the same thing with 3D. And part of the reason for that is that each of these different use cases uh, have slightly different requirements, right? And there's emerging advertising opportunities as well. So ideally, if a company wants to kind of, you know, invest in 3D, we want to make that barrier to entry as low as possible, right? So it would be too expensive to have to create a new asset for each use case, especially as that number of use cases continues to grow. It's much more valuable for everybody if we can create the content once and then use it everywhere. Um, so onto the next slide. This takes us to the uh, 3D Commerce Asset Validator project. Um, I've been working on this for the last few months, and we basically took the asset creation guidelines that we had released maybe two years ago. Um, and we were thinking about, all right, what would make it easier for retailers to adopt these standards? And what would make it easier for content creators to know the various you know, specifications for each of the customers? Because it is kind of a sliding scale, right? You have the, you know, the quality on one hand where you don't care about the file size or you know device constraints for performance and then the other side you want to get something really quick and and fast and you know out to users on their mobile devices um and so we understand that there's you know a lot of different factors so the way we've built the validator is essentially to provide a schema definition file so that's essentially the requirements for the given use case um and then the 3d model if you have product information we can also to collect that as well to measure things like dimensions that are product specific. Uh, but essentially, we're going to go through and check a whole bunch of attributes. Um, I listed some on the slide that we're checking. This is basically as a version one, which is uh, pretty much ready to release in the next couple of weeks. Um, those are the things that we're checking today. However, I mentioned, you know, this is just version one. We're hoping that, you know, we can continue the development um, into next year. And we know there are other, you know, areas and things to potentially check and support. Uh, but again, this is an open source project. It's currently on my personal GitHub. We'll be moving that over to the uh, Kronos GitHub in the next probably two to three weeks um, as this project gets wrapped up. Um, but you're welcome to you know provide comments or contribute through um, GitHub directly um, and or you know questions today in the session. Uh, you can email me as well. Um, but that's kind of a main overview of this package that we built. If we go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about how you can actually use it. Um, so there's also, as part of this project, two reference implementations. Uh, the code itself is a, a node 
JavaScript package, uh, well, technically TypeScript, but essentially it's JavaScript code that you can embed into um, your product or your backend. And we envision that the majority use case for this is, is automation, right? So the command line interface is primarily where we expect it to be used. Um, each of these attributes can basically come back as a pass fail or not tested. Um, and based on the schema definition file, um, you know, the settings are basically provided, right? So you can say what the minimum or maximum file size is, what's the triangle count range, um, how many materials, meshes, et cetera, that you want. Um, and you can choose to skip specific tests too, right? So in the schema file, you can basically say like, yeah, we don't really need to check for, you know, beveled edges, for example. Um, and so, yeah, the drag and drop tool for the web version is, uh, again, another reference implementation. Um, you know, it's a fairly simple visual web page. Uh, the goal of the code is really more to show you how you require the package and how you bundle it up with Webpack and then, you know, use it in a browser environment uh, versus a node environment because there are a few technical differences, um, but the validator itself works in both of those environments. Uh, and then, you know, there's a demo, a live demo. You can check out my personal website and you can also check out the code. Uh, this is current as of today. We're in version, uh, actually, <laughs> the screenshot's version 20, but we're in version 21 now. So yeah, continue to make progress with getting that to the first release. And then, um, you know, again, continued development. Uh, so that's it for my part of the presentation and actually for all of us kind of talking individually, what we're going to transition now to is more of a live Q&A discussion session. So I'm going to pass it back to Eric. Right. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Uh, it's super valuable. I mean, it, it, the volume of assets that we have to generate and just for the general ecosystem to be able to figure out other models in good shape. I mean, it's just uh, it's just going to be an essential tool. Uh, so now we're going to open up the floor, um, and these panelists have all been deeply involved in asset creation pipelines and open standards, and we're in these weekly calls uh, figuring this stuff out. Um, so we've got a couple questions already from the group. Um, let's see, William Harris asked, uh, how can we automate the conversion of assets from CAD files to real-time PBR formats? And I'm thinking maybe Pavel might be a good choice here. Yeah, I can take this one. Uh, so there are multiple approaches. Uh, the way we do it and the way I would advise it is to uh, build a modular pipeline. And what I mean by that, I'll explain in a second. But um, there are some some tools that allow you to take cut files and generate you know, uh, the end result. But I wouldn't say they're very flexible and they're great for the scale. So the way you would do it or the way I would do it is uh, you want to build your pipeline in a modular way. So you want to have small processes that develop like middle steps that then can be used in different uh, scenarios. So first you have your cut files, let's say they're JT, right? And you want to first convert your asset to, to something mesh-based, let's say FBX, and you can do it either directly from your uh, cut software. So I don't like from uh, SolidWorks, I think there, there's a plugin to export FBX and from Inventor, there's also a way to export FBX. So like you either use some internal tool or you JTs, I think can be also important to 3ds Max, but you want to have a step essentially to to decimate uh, to tessellate, sorry, to tessellate the the cut asset and get the mesh uh, asset right. But it's not real time ready yet. But again, I wouldn't advise to reach like from cut right directly to real time. I would say this is a good step because from this highly dense uh, tessellated asset, you can branch into different scenarios you can branch into offline rendering and you can then also branch into next steps to convert this asset further to your real-time uh, use so when you have this high dense uh, mesh that came straight from cut then you would optimize it with another step of the process let's say with rapid compact or, or some other tool you can you can use it to optimize to um, lower the poly count and then do all the other things that are necessary like remove interior of the assets, etc. So like remove all non-visible part, non-visually non relevant part. And then 
there's another thing, of course, which is material library, because you probably want to have PBR ready uh, materials that would match this asset. So if you're working in a big product company, you prob probably reuse the same materials on different products. So I would advise to have separate material library. And then in some automated way, when you have this uh, mesh asset, match the materials that probably the info about materials can come from CAD metadata or from they may be assigned as a placeholders on your CAD uh, parts and then you match it with your library and then you produce in the next step the let's say GLTF in the end right but the point is I would take it in the steps in a modular way because you never know or maybe you do uh how are you going to use each step of the of the asset creation uh process right and if you go for the solution like solution okay i have cut file and i generate the uh, real time right away then you lose control and you lose flexibility and you use you lose this possibility to branch into different use cases from the same asset so i would advise to make it in steps and have like simple like kind of small automated processes and you need a pipeline developer for that probably <laughs> so uh yeah but but i i would, I would reach for this modular approach of automated processes and generate one step at a time and in the end you end up with this after a few steps you end up with this asset and of course you need to validate it on the way because during conversion well things might go wrong there might be some some issues i hope this answers uh, if not please take comment in qa I, I will yeah say more yeah i mean there are a few problems there right it's like uh with cat assets sometimes you've got a gazillion triangles for a curved part and then almost nothing for really straight parts. And so sometimes you have really long, thin triangles and that's not gonna render well in a real-time application. So there's a bunch of stuff in there too. Like uh, there, there are newer like read topology tools that will kind of do a voxelized version of your model and will recreate the triangles in a more kind of even distribution. So some of those tools are out there like I know uh, Autodesk recently put out one that works in 3ds Max that's really nice. Uh, it's their read topology tool and you can, there's a whole bunch of like uh, ways that it can handle hard edges so it keeps the hard edges hard and still creates nice curvature. Uh, ZBrush also has some nice remeshing tools and there's there's a bunch of other stuff. Um, but yeah, that's it's a hard problem right to automate the conversion of really high poly, uh, stuff that often doesn't have UVs either. So you've got to create UVs for it. That's uh, a hard problem to solve. Uh, so I guess we can move on to this next question. Um, Amit Pandey asked about uh, support for KTX2 on other platforms like Android and iOS. And can we use KTX2 for gaming assets? Uh, so I guess I could take this. Um, KTX2, uh, let's see, we do have support on Android already with, um, let's see, there are several major uh, viewers supported already, like Model Viewer uh, from Google, and we have Babylon JS, and we have from Microsoft, and we have uh, the 3JS renderer. Um, they all support KTX2, and there are a few others that I'm forgetting right now, uh, but they'll all render in. Uh, I, uh, in both iOS and Android, uh, which is cool. It's just not native support for iOS. So if you try to load a, a GLTF file, say in um, Quick Look uh, in iOS, it's not really possible at this point, but we're looking into alternatives for that to see, hey, are there solutions that we can provide in an open source way that will kind of extend that view and make it more possible? Um, I mean, that the compression of KTX2 makes it really an attractive thing to implement because it stays compressed on the GPU. So, for example, you know, we at Wafer, we have like Room Planner. And we have to display a whole bunch of models in a space at once. Uh, and you quickly run out of memory if you try to load standard JPEG PNG assets. They just balloon like crazy in memory. So KTX2 provides us that way to keep stuff compressed when it's loaded into uh, RAM for rendering. Uh, yeah, and as so far as gaming that, assets yeah. go, I mean, you have already have compressed formats for that, like uh, uh, the direct, what is it, DirectX compressed formats and uh, um, 
uh, BC compressed formats. Uh, I'm sorry, you were going to go ahead, Mike. Uh, yeah, no, Eric, I was just going to say that, you know, on the slate for additional projects for next year for Kronos are some tools that would help, right? Uh, native GLTF viewer is one of the things that we're hoping to build out next year in 2023. Um, and we also have um, a couple different projects for converting KTX to, uh, textures. And there's a project to kind of put together the um, GLTF asset compressor that would then, you know, allow you to kind of drag and drop or automatically uh, convert stuff through the command line to create the asset, right? So there's like two sides of the problem. There's one, the viewer side, and there's the creation side. So we're more focused, I would say, on the creation side, although with a, you know, native Android, uh, or sorry, native iOS GLTF viewer, that kind of helps on the, the viewing side. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, a lot of it comes down to the implementation of the viewers themselves. And as we work on building out our certification program, um, that's another area that, you know, a viewer could potentially, maybe we're going to require, you know, those, that support, right? At the moment, our certification isn't really a full stamp of approval, but maybe that's a, a good thing to talk about, Eric, um, the endeavors that we've had to do asset certification as part of this group. Yeah, asset certification is a fun one, right? There's so many things around that. I mean, really comes down to, is your model going to render consistently across all the ways that you distribute it uh, through the web? And that's a really hard problem to solve. We're trying to look at, you know, how do you, if you certified a model to say, hey, this is the, uh, the stained glass lamp, right? That represents this product. And, uh, and it represents the faithful recreation of it. Um, if you certify that asset, then it has to stay kind of unchanged, but something that's core for GLTF is people being able to remix that and reuse it and edit it. And a lot of tools like Blender and other tools can import those assets and you can change it. So then it becomes, it's not really certified anymore. Um, but we've also looked at how do we uh, ensure that renderers are rendering things faithfully. So do they all support KTX2, for example? Do they all support transmission and these other extensions that make it look great? Um, and that's another hard problem to solve, but we're, we're looking into ways to try to figure that out um, and make it easier for content creators to just deploy their assets. Uh, but maybe, you know, Max might be able to talk on that too, because they're dealing with that somewhat with Rapid Compact and how to actually put out different versions, right? Yeah, thanks. Uh, of course. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, long story short, uh, like we're trying to cover this with presets, right? So we let people either use factory presets that we provide. So we try to provide the best possible preset, for example, to get your asset, let's say, into Spark AR, right? And then Spark AR has certain requirements. And then when you're working with that, then you can just throw in a bunch of assets, pick that preset, and we'll, we'll optimize it for you like that. But we also allow people to create their own because very often they have very specific requirements and they want like, let's say three different LODs that have like uh, they, their own like specification. So yeah, I um, hope that helps. I don't know if that, that answers the question properly. Oh, there's one other thing that I forgot to mention and that's the uh, GLTF Project Explorer. Uh, that's something that's also under development right now uh, in the Kronos calls is how can we expose what the features are that are available out there in different renderers and what supports what and what are all the different projects out there because there are a gazillion different uh, bits of software and bits of implementations that people have made for GLTF, which is awesome, right? It's like the ecosystem is just ballooning uh, like crazy, but it also means it's really hard to find specific things. So, uh, so that's where we wanted to figure out, you know, is there a way to filter all the different projects that are available out there and see, is there a way to make those easier to find? So how do we know that uh, that KTX2 is supported on different applications and different um, hardware solutions? Uh, maybe the Project Explorer is the right way to do that, to kind of expose that, expose that stuff. Uh, so let's see, uh, next question we had was from Alessandra Miro. She's, uh, they asked, uh, do you have any notes or advice for automating UVs or UV maps? Uh, anyone want to take that? I, yeah, I can talk a bit about it, maybe. 
other people have more more to add. Um, I mean, I know Mike is certainly working on like QA related aspects of that, right? And mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if the, the, this goes more into like it says automating UVs or UV maps. Does this go more into the creation? Uh, in that case, I mean, interesting to know where it comes from. Like for example, when you have a large 3D scan or so, or like whatever it is, and you want to like generate a new atlas, then that's something that we can do, of course, automatically, right? And basically trying to look at what would an artist do. So like creating new UVs and try to place the seams automatically at uh, like um, places where they're not so easy to spot and at the same time keeping the distortion low. So it's not an easy problem because you have several contradictory constraints to optimize for, right? Like you want to have a low number of charts, you want to have short seams, you want to have uh, low stretch, right? Um, which usually requires you to introduce cuts to keep it low and so on. But there are solutions for this. We have automated this also ourselves. And um, then, yeah, like packing these charts, right, into an atlas and then creating the different atlases by baking the textures, right? But then, um i think there are also a lot of interesting aspects on like do, doing qa on those right especially when it comes to things like tiling for example like uv tiling some if you have a cloth pattern also right yeah and i can speak a little bit to yeah, the can... automated checks too on that um you know once you know you actually generate the content um you can sometimes deal with issues where especially if you're trying to do an atlas um you might have overlapping uvs so our, our tool can kind of check that currently um, one of the, the last actual remaining feature for the validator is actually checking the UV margin size too, right? So if you're changing a texture from a high res 4k, but you're only like two pixels away, when that image gets resampled, those, you know, two pixels are going to be joined with their neighbors down to like one pixel if it's a 1k texture. So you start to, you know, run into potential issues with your, you know, UV spacing as well. Um, so those are things that we're hoping to, you know, address with the validator. You know, there's the automated check now, pass fail around, yeah, you know, are they far enough apart? Um, do they fit in that, you know, zero to one space? Um, the other, you know, opportunity, I think, for version two of the validator is to provide more of a visual, uh, especially if it fails, right? A visual indication of which part of the UV is is overlapping or which part of the UV maybe has an inverted normal, right? Sometimes that'll happen if you're copying a part and you're mirroring it, the UVs get inverted, um, and you don't necessarily notice that in the, the viewer itself, uh, but it can lead to problems down the line. So that's another thing we check for uh, as part of the process. But yeah, as far as actually like automatically generating UVs, uh, I think as Max said, there are tools out there. It continues to get better over time. Um, but yeah, it's still, it's a hard problem. Yeah, I can say that also, uh... If you're building your pipelines using Blender, there's also one tool like that there has like smart UV unwrap. Like it, it's uh, it depends on your use case because uh, like with the uh, best results I mentioned in my presentation, like it's not necessarily like the UV, what you expect from UV can be also a bit different depending on the scenario. So you have uh, some possibilities to, to use also Blender for automated uh, UV unwrapping. And in terms of checking, yeah, like uh, there's some validation, but again, in some cases, you might want to have overlapping UVs if you want to, like for, for baking shadows, of course not, but for if you have a lot of same elements and you're uh, trying to target small texture, you want them, you know, you want the same metalness and color, et cetera, and they, you want them to be overlapping. So I think at the, at the very beginning, of course, we target to like the basic uh, understanding, which is there should be no overlaps, there should be uh, no no uh, no issues like this. But in later stages, there are some edge cases when you want this behavior to be slightly different than this, right? And at that case, um, yeah, I, I hope Max can do the tool that will do everything for us. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but but yeah, but uh, uh, bottom line, yeah, uh, there are tools. Uh, you can also look into Blender for some simple scenarios. It doesn't work always perfectly, but it's one of the options. Awesome. Yeah, it's it's a hard problem, right? There's a lot of, uh, that's one of the cool things about SIGGRAPH each year is that there are all kinds of papers about, hey, how can we automate these things? How can we make them work better? The one other thing that's kind of fits into that is 
uh, I know there's been research been done out there with neural networks to figure out how can we apply UVs in an automated fashion uh, and using machine learning to figure, to look at large data sets of really well UV models and figure out what are the what are the strategies there. The unfortunate side of that is that there's so many different like edge cases and weird little things about how to create UVs that it's a pretty hard problem to solve in a totally automated way. I could see like maybe coming up with a tool that automatically assigns say UVs to be the seams to be underneath things and where you wouldn't uh, often see them or uh, you know automatically fix, fixing stretching that kind of thing. Uh, so I, I expect that we'll see a lot of uh, improvements in the coming years as as people tackle these problems with large neural networks. Yeah, another area that we ran into when we were doing the asset validation is on the texel density, right? So that's kind of your pixels per meter. And so, you know, you could kind of come up with some rough numbers, but when you go to an individual model, there are parts of the model that you actually want to have a high density, like if it's a logo or a label or something with some small text, um, you want to allocate a lot of pixels to that, you know, particular part of the model. And maybe of like a piece of glass that doesn't really have any, you know, texture details per se, but it takes up a large percentage of the product. Um, you might minimize your UV area for that to kind of, you know, not waste any of your texture space, but it, it kind of throws off those numbers on the, um, you know, texel density from a, a quick automated check. Uh, so that's another area we felt like there could be a visual tool that might give you like a heat map of the 3D model. So you can see like the denser areas of the pixels and versus the sparser ones. And as the part of the QA process, you can kind of manually review that, does this make sense, right? Are we allocating enough, um, you know, resolution for the important areas of the model? Um, because if you're, you know, put some of these models in front of a customer, let's say the, the UV space isn't good enough for their logo, they'll look at it and say like, oh, it's blurry, or, you know, it doesn't look right, or it's pixelated or something. They won't necessarily know that's why, because the, you know, UV map needs to be redone. And so there's a little bit of a language barrier between, you know, the artists and the technical speak around, yeah, we need to, you know, adjust the UVs versus this thing looks blurry or this part of the model doesn't look right. And so the more we can kind of visually, you know, provide that feedback um, through the QA process, the easier it is, I think, for both sides to, to get that feedback. Awesome. Uh, let's see, uh, we got another question from Jason Coleman asking about remeshing. Uh, basically, you know, how do you remesh to really complex models like a car, for example? Uh, is there, you know, are the applications out there, depending on topology, that could do a better job? Um, maybe, maybe Max, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I can, can yeah. Uh, provide at least some answer, like some idea that comes to my mind. And yeah, thanks for the question, Jason. So um, just because you mentioned cars, like something that I have seen in the past working successfully um, is this thing that was referred to as selective refinement. So um, maybe you have seen it as well, but that's uh, my answer right now to every question like that. And I hope that makes sense. So the idea is, for the people who don't know about it, like you can, for example, pre-generate like different LODs, right, for each part. And that is kind of like the geometry equivalent of what Mike was just talking about for the textures. So let's say if in the cut model, the logo uh, is a certain like piece of geometry, right? It should look round and nice and just look good and have like good normals, right? And so on. And um, the more you reduce it, right, the uh, more apparent the artifacts will become. And maybe on other parts, it doesn't bother you so much. And so the selective refinement approach is basically like the same as what, what Mike said for the textures. You um, pre-optimize all the parts in different um, like uh, resolutions, say like reduce them by 50% or by 90 or 95 or 99% and so on. And then, of course, assuming that like the uh, remesher or the um, decimator would per se like distribute the uh, mesh resolution within each object, within each LOD properly, right? Uh, so I'm not sure if that was your question, but like the selective refinement part, just saying that's the geometry equivalent of the, the texture part, like where you can then ideally in an interactive tool go in 
select a node and then maybe use your mouse wheel to change the LOD, right? And go through them. And then maybe you have like another display somewhere that tells you like this is the total uh, triangle budget that you're using right now, right? And then this way you can either say reduce all by a bit and then go uh, to the lower and just increase that one. And then you get a really nice result in a really short time. So that's something that we have been investigating with a client, what we're doing right now, actually, with them. And um, I think that's a promising approach, uh, although it's, of course, a semi-manual approach. But I think that's better than um, many workflows in practice that are used in that industry. Uh, of course, still a lot of manual work, right? <clears throat> Yeah, I can weigh in sl slightly. So if you're talking about the car in this case, like if you're talking about one asset, then you can yeah, definitely tweak it uh, manually a bit. But if you're then looking at the big say, I know your home appliance company and you have thousands of fridges and, and dishwashers and whatever, then uh, once you do this initial evaluation that Max talked about, then you can include in the metadata or in your scripts business logic uh, presets for configuring the tool that's uh, auto-optimizing those those uh, those. Uh, Geometries, right? So uh, it's not like you have to have it manually always. Like you have to do the initial ma manual uh, verification. But then, uh, even in CAD uh, system, like in PLM or somewhere, there is a way to tag or add metadata to specific parts so that then your uh, scripts or automation can read that, hey, like auto, like con convert or optimize uh, this type of geometry uh, with this preset and then this one needs a bigger uh, density or something, right? So the things that Max talked about, they're also automatable in the bigger scale. Uh, once you do, of course, the initial evaluation of what works what for what type of uh, asset or part of the asset. Cool. Uh, let's see, there's another question from uh, Tomas about, um, is there a way to do a standardized uh, levels of detail for geometry in a GLTF model? Um, I, I know that there's already a, um, there's an extension from Microsoft that covers LODs uh, and I'll try to post it in the chat here. Uh, that's a link to that particular extension, but you know, standardizing it to one particular thing, I, I'm not really sure yet. Um, and it might be an interesting um, opportunity, Eric, to talk about the GLXF uh, discussions that we're having. So as a, you know, kind of um, higher level scene organizational tool, um, we've been recently talking about GLXF as a different file type that could link to GLTF files. So if you had a collection of, of models you wanted to put together, that might be a, a solution for, you know, having multiple uh, levels of detail within a single file. Um, or for compositing scenes or for providing more interactions and behaviors um, that's still like kind of, you know, in development internally. Um, but I think, you know, it's an area that we could use to potentially bundle up um, multiple files uh, as LODs, as external references that could be loaded based on the viewer specification, right? So that might be how close the camera is or how much bandwidth the customer has or whatever other business logic uh, you want to develop in your application. As long as there's one file that kind of contains all those various LODs, uh, we think that could be an interesting approach. But there's no current plan other than you know the the Babylon uh, extension um, to support that, as far as I know, in GLTF. Oh, but we had that discussion actually. I think I think the like it's being discussed amongst other things like smart loading, etc. So mm -hmm. uh, I would say the plan is being formed. So yeah. The, the very yeah, short so answer is yes. <laughs> so very short answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, it's being discussed and and it's being looked at. Uh, but yeah, but uh, the functionality or the technical solutions you need to provide all these can be also used for different things, and the other way around. Some some other things can be used for that. So we we are having discussion on what should be possible inside of GLTF format itself in the area of either swapping the assets or containing multiple versions of the assets or like there's there are multiple angles to it uh both business and technical requirements so but yeah, the, the plan is there it's just not uh, finished yet 
Yeah, one other thing too that was brought up is a, a smart loading idea, right? Which you could use LODs for that. So for example, if you have a really big asset that takes a long time to download, but you've got a client with a really slow connection, uh, you could stream in a really low res version of the model that's even without any textures, for example, it's just like a ghosted view or even a, just a billboard, just a, a single image. So when they're looking uh, uh, through their phone and they want to see an AR version, an augmented reality of you know uh, uh, a chair in their room, but it's taken a while to download, well, perhaps we could stream in a lower LOD of that model as an initial step so they at least have something to see while it's loading the rest of the model in the background. Uh, yeah, a lot of times for really AR, cool. like the main value is that size, right? You want to place it in your space to see if that if that couch or that table is going to fit. So even without all the high res texture details or rich geometry, um, something that loads quick is going to be more valuable to a customer than something that has all the perfect detail. You don't want to preclude them from waiting a little longer and getting that higher detail. Um, but if you can provide something instantaneous to at least get them going and, and not have people walk away, it's one of the big challenges as we think about, you know, our e-commerce mission is that, you know, if a standard web page takes more than I think it's like two seconds, or maybe it's even less these days. But there's a you know period of time that's pretty short that consumers just kind of close the tab or you know switch to another app and they lose interest, right? So if you have a large file, even if it's you know perfectly detailed, they're not going to wait around ten seconds or thirty seconds or a minute to download that asset. But if they get something instant instantly and they're playing with it, and that fidelity kind of rolls in, um, you know, it's going to have a lot of value. Cool. Well, that's, I think that's it for all the questions from the group. Uh, okay. Well, th thank you, Eric. Thank you, Powell, Max, and Mike. The presentations were excellent and very well done. We appreciate your time and effort today. As a reminder, a recording of this presentation along with the slides will be available on the Kronos Group website, and a direct link will be sent to you in a follow-up email. As you leave the webinar, please take a moment to fill out the survey that pops up. Your feedback is important to us and helps us improve these presentations. Please let us know if there are other Cronus related topics you may be interested in. And thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed your webinar. Have a great day. Yep. Thanks, everyone. It was great.